Well, hello, and uh, welcome to this live streamed exchange talk from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. I'm Stephen Broad, Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange at the Conservatoire, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's talk from our distinguished and cherished colleague, Professor Roy Howitt. Now, Roy is one of those people who brings together with an appearance of ease um, the worlds of performance, research and scholarship. That ease comes from a lifetime's work. And although he tends to be associated with uh, French music, particularly due to his doctoral thesis uh, on Debussy and important editions of Debussy and Faure in particular, he is tonight going to share some of the insights that he's developed during his recent work on Chopin and his etudes. But before I hand over to Roy, just let me say a little bit more about how this live stream talk will work. And this is as much for my benefit as anyone else's. You, of course, can, can see me and hear me um, at the moment. And in a moment, you'll be able to see and hear Roy. Um, however, and I say this partly to reassure you, no one else can be seen or heard during this talk. Roy is going to speak for about 30 minutes. And during that time, you can use Zoom's Q&A window, which you can open by clicking the button, Q&A button, just at the bottom of your screen, uh, to propose questions that I can pose to Roy in the discussion that will follow his talk. And if you like someone else's uh, question, you can give that a little, uh, little vote, and I can use that to help me decide which questions to prioritise in that discussion. And the discussion will last about 15 or 20 minutes or so. Finally, if you'd like to use the live captioning facility for this talk, you'll find a link to that um, in the, the chat box, which you can access, similar to the Q&A, at the bottom of the screen by clicking the button marked chat. So with all of that housekeeping safely done, it's time, finally, to hand over to Professor Roy Howitt. Roy. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? I hope you can. Good. That's the... There are challenges in this, we're still getting used to it, but <clears throat> my piano is ready. And our topic tonight is uh, various aspects of Chopin's etude, which I've now been editing with the help of uh, an RCS Athenaeum grant for, would you believe it, some years. You think it's editing something like that, 27 pieces. Well, they're not huge pieces, but you'd think you might get it done in a year. But in fact, there's so much ground to cover, such a chaos of differing sources to sort out, trying to work out what source is going to one, be one's principal source, how you get a coherent thread through it, um, and there are very strict guidelines for the new Peters edition Chopin, of which this is going to be part, that it's taken a while, and there's an editorial board that checks everything for coherence so that the volume that I produce is going to be coherent and consistent with the other volumes in the series as well, and that we put things in a reasonably similar manner, that we're all pointing in the same direction. In the course of this, of course, as a pianist, uh, I'm interested in trying to glance, and I want to get across in the edition as well, what is it that Chopin is trying to do in these etudes. Uh, I'll, I'll start sharing a screen with you now. Um, the first picture on my share screen, let me get this going. Uh, oh, it's done it. Now, are you seeing it? Good. Um, it went faster than I thought it would. So here are some of our basic resources. Up at the top is some of Chopin's uh, handwriting on a good clear day, when you can see it well. Uh, bottom left is one of our best resources, Chopin, pianist and teacher, as seen by his pupils. It's the English edition of Jean-Jacques Eigeldinger's classic Chopin vu par ses élèves. <coughs> it's a compendium of all that's been put down on record by Chopin's friends, pupils, contemporaries about how he taught the piano, how he played, how he taught music, uh, what his views were. There's a tantalizingly small amount that deals specifically with the etude. Most of them are descriptions of him playing them and how beautiful it was, but there are one or two very telling um, extracts all the same. And then I've also shown you Chopin's hand, which was not a particularly large one, but a very flexible one. Flexible, I think, is the key. Everything about his piano teaching was about flexibility, 
suppleness um, and mu musical expressivity and coherence in telling a, a like um, a narrative, telling a story through playing. And this link to the chopinonline.ac.uk is an amazing resource that has been put up by various people headed by John Rink at Cambridge University, who is also um, the, the sort of the center of gravity of our editorial board for the new complete Chopin, the, the Peter's edition new Chopin. But this, this resource, you can go in various directions once you're in there. You can see the first editions of pretty well everything by Chopin, all the surviving 30 uh, first editions, the French ones, the English ones, the German ones, and Austrian ones, Viennese ones, and Polish ones, and anything else. And you can also go into the Variorum edition, which will let you home in on any particular bar of any piece, and you can compare man existing manuscripts with first editions, with different first editions, reprints of them, and markings that Chopin put on students' copies while he was teaching. You can imagine this has made the editing task possible for me, but anyone can get in there. So that's why I'm showing you the link now. Now, to <clears throat> the material that we've been left of Chopin's Etude. Well, let me, I'm just going to try and get this working. There we are. There is the opening page or part of it of the very first Etude from Opus 10. It was published uh, when Chopin was just turning uh, 23, would you believe? He started writing these in his late teens as he was on his way from Warsaw, um, going through Vienna and Germany towards Paris, where he would spend the rest of his life. When he got to Paris, he found a publisher who issued these etudes. But it starts like this. Um, it's a famous page. It's sometimes turned into a terrifically athletic romp. It can also be made quite expressive, but I just wanted to look at this and show you what happens at the bottom of the page. There's a little red ring around something, and I'll come to that. So it starts quite vigorously, 14. And as you come through it, it's uh, there are interesting forms, these. They look quite conventional but, conventional, but in fact they're very inventive inside them. And you'll be used to hearing this um, from almost any uh, YouTube CD recordings. You have the big triumphant recapitulation. Sorry. The only thing is that that score, and this is the only version of the dynamics we have from Chopin, it says diminuendo into the recapitulation. quietly. Not very often. There's a late 19th century tradition of turning that into a, a, a big crescendo to a rousing fortissimo for the recapitulation. And that is carried on. Although every critical edition, there's, there have been quite a few of them, uh, really since the 1880s onwards, I've, almost every critical edition shows Chopin's dynamic there. Um, there's just this tradition has carried on in, in the teeth of it, and you'll still hear it everywhere. But this is something to take seriously, obviously. We've, uh, Chopin is saying effectively, now do it again quietly. He doesn't want us to thunder. Um, and through the rest of the piece until the end, the dynamics go a little bit up and down, but they're mostly on the low side, if you pay close attention to, to the score. There's some hairpins up and then down again, and a diminuendo on the last line. So let's just move on from that and look at the, that <clears throat> opening. And I'm looking at the opening now of three of his etudes from this 1833 collection, well, published in 1833. The first one, the eighth one, and the twelfth one, they've all got running semi-quavers of some sort. And they also all have Accents, if you notice carefully. What does he mean by these? We can play them literally, 
And one of the things I find I'm always having to deal with when I'm teaching is students trying to work out what these are. You can have, you, you will often hear. Is that very useful? In number eight. You know, and I'm not playing it very fast. I'm a way below his metronome marks, but that's another topic I might come back to later. And I'm doing it a bit under speed so that you can hear what I'm doing and I'm trying to mark these accents. It's not actually very musically helpful. What's he after with these accents? Um, I suspect that it has to do with this. This was the most, the simplest and the most revolutionary thing about his teaching. Uh, this particular pupil was a Scottish one. We don't know what her name was. She wrote down her, or spoke, I, we don't know which she wrote, uh, but she passed her memories, memories on to Cuthbert Haddon, who wrote one of the earliest, one of the early biographies of Chopin, not, not that early actually, in, well into the 20th century. And he reported her as the anonymous Scottish lady, simply, who, who was just a little bit too modest. Oh no, I don't want them to tell, don't sell them my name, just sell them I was a pupil of Chopin, a modest, a modest lady, but who said she was surprised. She had always been told, press down this note, and Chopin said, no, let the hand fall. And she said, instantly, everything became easy. Now, if we read that against these accents, suddenly, one sees the accents are telling us where to let the hand fall. If I go straight into the beginning of number eight, um, is this an etude for the right hand? Just, well, first of all, look at these accents. Number 12, instead of pushing down the note, just let the hand fall. The accents actually show on where to, where to let the hand fall so that the, the figurations become easy. And <clears throat> the next thing from that is going back to the first one, uh, Chopin, this is the most detailed advice we have from Chopin. It's tantalizingly little, but to one of his best students, Friederike Streicher Müller, uh, Müller was her married name, he, she re reported years later that Chopin said, at one of the last lessons, on you go, practice this etude slowly every morning. Do it will do you good, but you have to practice it slowly. Do it slowly, not fast. Um, and if it's practiced the wrong way, it will have the opposite effect from what it's meant to have. It is meant to stretch out the hand. And even if you don't have a large hand, it's just, it's designed to make the hand and wrist very supple and able to, to cover big distances. Again, these accents that help you. Sorry about that. Um, from that, the other thing is, how much do you want to hear these figurations? If these accents don't mean stress the notes, if they just mean let the hand fall. I think of number eight, and here we get into the nitty gritty of what these say to are for. Is this a... Helter Skelter. It is etude are more interesting than most people's etude, but they still sound like etude and exercise is. But what happens? If the musician Chopin is saying, keep the right hand busy, the left hand's going to make some music. to get the right hand quieter. What I'd really like to do, you notice there's no dynamic at the beginning of that piece. I'd quite like the, the right hand to be fairly quiet and happen so easily and smoothly that the left hand is bringing, bringing out the piece of music that's there. You may notice that the texture is turned basically upside down in number 12, the famous so-called revolutionary study, though <clears throat> the more you find out about Chopin, the more it seems that that's probably some sort of red herring um, and that his, his inspiration and models for this piece were something quite different. They were nothing to do with, with anger at 
<laughs> revolutions um, singing it. <laughs> There's quite a study for the right hand in carrying a line expressively. It's also a study for the left hand in making all these semiquavers expressive too. Um, and the closer the closer one gets into them, the more you see going on in these. That's why, as you say, two, I think, are so interesting and why they go so much further than almost anything of their time. They're, they're challenging in all sorts of ways. I suspect too that they're this is Chopin, who became a friend of Delacroix. Their etude in composition, because the, the directions, they, they take him compositionally. And the way they try and draw you into his own compositional processes and understand what's going on in a musical narrative. So, oh yes, the, my little blue rings there. I'm just putting a ring around the ears. And the first one, he says, legato. So if it's, if it's too fast and hard, too athletic, you lose that legato. The same legatissimo in a revolutionary. They, I keep calling it the revolutionary out of habit, but it's the C minor one. So here, he's saying leg legatissimo for the left hand, really, really smooth, despite all these accents. Now, I'll move on back to the beginning of number one with all these accents. Now, at the end of this extract, look at that accent. So what you ha we have are accents going up on every beat in the first system, and then the pattern continues through the second system, the third system, but the accents aren't there any longer. We can take them for granted. It's basically simile, a simile. Keep doing, keep, keep whatever these accents mean, keep going. But then in the third system, he starts use, from then on, the accents are much sparser and they are, they come where there's a, where the slow moving melodic line changes um, um, so so it is the passing note, and all through the piece, when you get one of these notes, is particularly on a weak beat, but one something that he just wants to hear, then we get that's where the accents are. So I can see two levels of accents going on in that piece. The one level of accent is technical, saying this is this is where you aim the hand for, drop the hand there, that's going to keep you on course. Now I want these ones, this is your melodic line. What's he got there? I'll, <clears throat> I'm, I'm now just showing you two extracts from the, this etude, because I think they are the ones that reveal what has always been ex uh, suspected about this etude. Bach was a worshipper, sorry, Bach, I jumped the gun, Chopin was a worshipper of the music of Bach. Um, and it's, this etude has always been compared with the first of Bach's 48. And you think, though, this big athletic romp, how would that compare with uh, something mm. like... Let's just take these bars that I'm showing you. I'll turn that down. Um, um, and then the other one there. well verbatim in a couple of places but he's just locked that into the piece and he's going in other directions so how do we he how do we hear how we perform it here i'd like to, you to hear a performance that's <clears throat> a bit of a surprise it was a surprise to me uh, it wasn't from where i expected it i was trying to find 
pianists who treated this piece not like an, just an uh, athletic romp, but who are treating it, who are linking it to Bach, and who might pay, pay some attention to the dynamics that Chopin wrote into the piece. And the one I found surprised me. I'll put it's on YouTube, so I have to. I can't. I have to go into the. Um, I need to find the place to open it up, but you should be able to hear this now when I start it. I'll just get this going again for you. And here is the person, Vladimir de Pachmann, the reputed eccentric. I would like you to hear him recording this in the recorded in 1911. That it wasn't so late in his life either. Let me find this. I hope you can hear this all right. And I will stop talking while it plays. Quite surprising. <clears throat> Pachmann, of course, is, has, has a reputation for being the greatest eccentric, eccentric in the history of piano playing. And in later years, he became famous for giving concerts and punctuating them with his own commentary on how the concert was going. Isn't it lovely? He would stop and say, or, or bravo Pachmann if it went well. And a, a friend of mine who heard him once uh, said he would even stop and say, phooey Pachmann if, it, if something was not as good as he wanted it to be. But he was a thoroughly good musician, you can hear. I think this was before he got so eccentric. Maybe he got bored in later years. But uh, what interests me is you immediately hear Bach coming through there. I've never heard the Bach come through so strongly in any performance. He even does a quiet recap as Mart. Um, he's one of the only people I've ever heard do it. And there he is, you know, there's a Nortex player. Um, and despite all the liberties they took in these days, He's play, he's every note, I think, he sticks to the score like glue, closer than almost anyone I've heard. Um, he voices it, you can hear him bringing out the melodies, but that's because he's heard the Bach and he's paying attention to all these long accents. If you look at the, the screen there, you'll see that last bar of the screen, there are long accents that Chopin has put in. He's bringing all these out and he's doing additional ones. He's doing the ones that are obvious that Chopin didn't mark because they're, they're so obvious, they're part of that line. He's, He's putting that, that line together. I think he's somehow 
he grasped what these were for. I must find out more about his um, heritage, who taught him and where he got all this from. But there's something very interesting there. Uh, <clears throat> I enjoy listening to that. I'll move on from it. <clears throat> Opus 10, number 10, uh, the lovely A flat major. A flat is, I think, is sort of Chopin's favorite key, I suspect. Um, this one interests me because there's there's an obvious purpose in this one, which got rather corrupted in the first edition because it was so badly misprinted that the we lost a lot of this. What happens is that it starts, it's uh, accented and slurred in syncopated pairs. So we've got... Uh, And then in threes, and then uh, on beat pairs, but quiet. Then staccato. I'll just play the beginning of, of it quickly to let you hear what's going on there. Because Chopin starts it that way, and then for the rest of the piece, we don't know what's going to come when. He keeps changing them around, but then he's taking on a, as on a musical journey. surprise every time there because every time I go into that section I want to play them in pairs because of the way the melody is moving but he's saying no accent them against the melody in threes so there are little surprises there the whole time he did fiddle about with the way he marked that piece up before it went into print but part of that was because the first the the first engraving of it had got the first tran uh, transition wrong at bar five and it carried on the accent pattern from the first four bars so while Chopin was trying to, to fix that in last proofs and uh, he was indulging in damage limitation, he took a lot of them out and it's not so quite so clear. His purpose isn't quite as clear as it was in the manuscript. That's why I'm showing you that manuscript. <clears throat> but also this, there's, there's a whole etude in composition, the way that piece is written. It's taking you into, into the whole process of how he composes, how you read lines, how the hands interact, different rhythms and so on across the hand. There's a wealth of purpose in there that I enjoy. And then there's <clears throat> this little figure. Do you recognize it? It looks like something you know, except it doesn't sound quite like it. Well, you think it should be the second of Chopin's etude, but it's not quite. There's the, Chopin, the second of Chopin's etude. You can see the relationship. Uh, Sorry. Um, so the difference is that one of them is running at the thumb end of the hand and Chopin's one is running at the unconventional, the older type of harpsichord fingering end where four and three go over five. So what's the first one? It's Morshley's. The set published just shortly before Chopin wrote his. And in a way Chopin, who was still in his teens when he wrote that, is you can see him doing a sort of schoolboy Poof of Moshelis. Um, and he's saying, well, yes, of course, we all we all get taught to do chromatic scales with our with our thumbs, but what happens if you don't use your thumb so much? And what happens if you do a chromatic scale without using your thumb at all? The thumb doesn't come into that top line at all during that whole piece. The whole thing is done. There's a couple of a couple of occurrences of two, but it's nearly all done with three, four, and five. Um, so what Moshelis may have made of that, he must have known it. The, the two of them knew of each other very soon. Uh, he, must, he took it in good part because the two composers eventually met and became instant friends in autumn 1839. Within about a week of meeting, they've been summoned to play duets for the French royal family. 
and they played uh, Moshlis's, uh, there's a big duet sonata by Moshlis, which they played together, not only there, but they, they gave many performances of that together. They got on very well. It would have been then that Moshlis said, could you write some pieces for me? Because he was putting together um, a, a piano tutor, a whole big musical tutor in two volumes called the Method de Method, the Method to End All Methods. There's a bit of wit in that. And then, but he, Chopin had by then had already published his two collections, 24 etudes, the Opus 10 and the Opus 25. And he wrote three much shorter and more restrained ones for Moshley's. Um, <clears throat> but with plenty of unexpected material, they're, they're much more intimate. They explore expressive playing. And you see these big long slurs. You have to keep a, lot, a line going. Now look at these markings there. What are these markings? These little oblique lines. They're thumb markings on black keys. <laughs> already done a few unconventional thumb markings. I'm sorry, it was a screen at the right angle so that you could see what I was doing. <clears throat> you just play these with your thumb. Instead of writing little accents on them or writing to Newto, he just says, use your thumb, and it brings out that lovely repeated motive. Now, what interests me about that etude is <clears throat> the most obvious thing you see right through that etude. It's a it's a, pre it's a study for playing threes against fours, threes in the right hand against fours in the left hand. But at the same time, what does the right hand do? It has all sorts of things to do. We've got these thumbs, but these thumbs are only where you have to get to. <coughs> Excuse me. How does one get there? I've just marked in red there. It's not Chopin's fingering, but what's marked in red is what basically what you have to do to get there. <clears throat> a thumb on a B flat, a black key, the first bar, and then another thumb on the same B flat, and then a thumb on the A flat to get there so that you can then be on the fourth finger from the A flat. And there are various ways you can get from that third thumb to the four at the end of the third bar. But the way I like to do it is this, and I think that's the way I find myself doing it. And it's, again, it's one of his crossing, it's one of his, the old harpsichord type fingering that had gone out of usage, which somehow Chopin picked up again. Um. <laughs> beautifully under the hand. Part of the reason I'm doing that is that there are so many places in this piece that the only way you can get a leg the legato he marks is by doing unconventional fingers and crossing threes and fours over fives. He may have been having <clears throat> a little bit of fun with Moshlis, with whom he got on very well <coughs> by then saying, there you are, have a few thumbs. We're not used to this. Moshlis was an older generation. And at the, the end of the third piece, the, of the third of these uh, nouvelles études, as they became known, the trois nouvelles études, they were published separately as that. Um, this is a piece for a legato top melody with a staccato accompaniment. <laughs> gives us a bit of fun. Here are these markings again. It's not just a thumb and a black key, but it's saying a thumb on every black key. Bounce down. It's as if to say, all right, you've worked really hard with your third, fourth, and fifth fingers. Now you can have some thumb, some fun bouncing down the keys, and it's goodbye. That's the the end of, of that set. Not for me yet, but from, from Chopin for for his etude. 
he was teaching people to use use their fingers freely and expressively and inventively at the keyboard in order to get exactly the effects and the colors he wanted. In the middle of these etudes, I showed this a while ago at another lecture. There's something interesting there that <clears throat> had, has not been printed yet. It's going to come out in the new edition. All the old editions have done this. <laughs> do that, that sort of slightly softer version of the harmony leads the hand to the top line. <clears throat> but if you take what Chopin wrote, which I think it was probably Moshley's correcting proof, so I don't want to blame him for anything, but somebody correcting final proofs thought, oh, that must be a mistake, and put in that extra natural there. Um, what, um, what Chopin wrote was... the texture um, to the right thumb. It's as if these three etudes there, he's actually admitting that his favourite finger is the right thumb, at least at that time. Not for everything. See, he had, all his fingers were favourites for different things, but there's a particular emphasis on what the right thumb can do as a sort of anchor, and it suggests to me that for him it was an anchor for his piano playing. Both thumbs were, but the right thumb particularly and incidentally, I digress slightly, but for Debussy, it was his left thumb. I suspect Debussy was a left-hander, and he, the left thumb has exactly the same role in his piano textures as the right thumb does in Chopin's, but that would be another lecture. Time is racing on, I, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. Before we go, I just have to, to show you Chopin in action. <laughs> one of these is Billy Merrill and the first one is Chopin. Billy Merrill knew his Chopin very well and you can see where a whole tradition of that music <clears throat> is coming from. Um, <clears throat> I should be winding up now because I'm over my half an hour and I'll just leave you with a few performing quotes. This came from my friend Henry Roche who in London, professional a concert pianist who, who was the principal pianist for many years with the Royal Ballet. His great-great-grandfather happens to be Ignaz Moscheles. He has Moscheles' desk in his front room. But he has these papers that came down the family. This came from his grandfather, I think. Chopin gave her lessons, piano lessons. Moscheles sent his daughter, Emily, for lessons and showed her how his waltzes should be played, not rapidly as they are now performed. This is what the, <clears throat> the tradition was passed down. Sometimes, of course, you, you really have to move, and Chopin doesn't want to drag either. But I think the, the tradition of belting Chopin and rushing him or scrambling him is just something he did not like, because he always compared performing with uh, a narrative and declaiming and speaking and said it was like somebody who garbled, garbled their words if you garbled your playing. So that's the one thing I'd like to show. And that's the other one. This was one of Chopin's students and friends. He sat in when Chopin had an, a, his, a young prodigy, Carl Filch, who died very young. But he played Chopin's concerto and Chopin played the orchestra part for him on the second piano. And this is, he was listening to the advice that Chopin was giving. First tenor, first soprano, always a singer, a bravura singer in the rapid figuration. That sounds to me like Mozart's rapid figurations. When you hear his soprano arias, of course, it's the same thing. Um, all the passage, passage work to be fashioned in a cantabile style. That, for me, that takes me back to these opening passages in the three etudes I showed you at the beginning. That, <clears throat> so whether it's this. It's cantabile the whole time, and that accounts for his legato legatissimo. 
would have loved to be a fly on the wall and seen that happening. Can you imagine Chopin playing second piano for his student playing his music? I will sign off with the, the screen there. Um, again, Marc Montella, an acquaintance of Chopin, not one of his students, but Marc Montella, who became a famous piano teacher, taught Debussy, Albanet and others. He knew about Chopin's friendship with Delacroix, and that's the famous Delacroix portrait of Chopin, which Marc Montel owned at one time. It's now in the Musée de la Musique in Paris. It used to be in the director's office at the Paris Conservatoire. If you want to see the director, it was hanging behind his desk. But it used to be hanging above Marc Montel's piano. So when young Debussy and his teens went for his piano lessons, Marc Montel would appear at 11 o'clock still in his dressing gown, and that painting would be hanging above his piano. Just imagine what that would have been like. I have gone on long enough, so I will, <clears throat> I'll take the slides down. You can see me again, if I can work out how to do this. Here we are, stop share, then you'll see me again. And I think some of you may have questions you'd like to ask. Roy, thank you so very much. Yes, there are some questions. And what a fascinating talk. I'm sure there will be all sorts of uh, new questions that come along as as uh, we continue this discussion. Um, I love the way you let fall the little um, pearls of wisdom, as it were, um, describing de Pachmann as an ur text player as a particularly nice thing to remember. Um, the, the, there have been a number of questions um, from various different places, and I want to start with uh, a couple of connected questions uh, which come from Daniel Horn, who's at the, the Wheaton College Conservatory of Music in the States. So um, these questions came in quite early in your talk, but they connect to the idea of um, Chopin as a teacher. And because you referred to that over and over again, um, it seemed to me as though they became more and more pertinent as time as the, as the talk went on. So I'll, I'll read you Daniel's uh, question. Roy, how sacrosanct do you consider Chopin's su surviving fingerings to be? What room do you suggest leaving for the needs of individual pianists? I'm asking particularly in the light of, in the, light of the need I have in the teaching studio to adjust for smaller hands. Yeah, since you said so much about Chopin as a teacher and directing his own music, I thought well, that's a good place to start. Well, that's a lovely question. Thank you, Dan, for that. Um, <clears throat> takes us right into the heart of it. There are two answers. One is I would pay very close attention to all his fingering. It's there to help us. But also, don't, don't be stuck with it. If it does not work, use something else. And the proof of that pudding is in the sources of these pieces. Quite often, there's more than one set of fingering by Chopin. For example, when they, he's, the etudes, like most of his pieces, came out simultaneously in three different countries, usually in London, Germany, and Paris. Uh, you'll find that uh, his, the, these editions were marked up differently. He was a bit editorially inconsistent, to put it <clears throat> nicely. That's, it's, our, it's our fun. But it's the, in fact, it's the Etude for Six, the D-flat one in the second set. The, the German edition came out with Chopin's fingering. It's on, it's on the manuscript that served for that. You can see that Chopin penciled his fingering on before it went to print. But the, the French edition came out without that fingering, so he marked in a completely different set of fingering for one of his students whom he was teaching there for these runs in six. So there, there's at least more, you know, he'd, he worked it out either with her hand in mind or just because that's the way he felt that fingering them that day. So his fingering's there to help us try it. I would say, I would say always try it. I usually think, oh yes, it's, I prefer that. But for example, in the, the F major one, there's one version of the fingering that goes one, two, one, two. He originally had two, one, two, one. Then he changed it, then he changed it back again because he realized that if he went on to two there, he would have got a fair stretch to get back to the two. So it depends on your size of hand. He did say also to Friederike Streicher, um, or she reports, it is that first study, she thought it might be a study only suited to people with large hands. And Chopin said, no, the very contrary. Uh, and she remarked when she related this in later years, it was to Frederick Meeks, who quoted her memoirs and his, uh, his uh, big biography of 
of Chopin. She said that Chopin's hands weren't particularly big, they were just very flexible. And the whole thing about that opening etude was that it was there to show you how to cover big stretches and make a small hand flexible enough to cover large stretches. And people said of Chopin that watching his hand, which was not large, covering these big stretches, like for example, in um, in the the left hand in the B flat minor scherzo, where you're doing this over almost two octaves and you're not crossing over the thumb at all. Um, it was like watching a snake swallow a rabbit, somebody once said. You see this small hand would suddenly go whoop <laughs> and swallow a couple of octaves with just a little turn. So it was suppleness and everything about his teaching was directed at suppleness. So the fingering's there to help us. But, you know, if, <clears throat> if it's not comfortable, find some, First of all, try and work out why it's not comfortable, because there may be a stiffness in the wrist that's obstructing it. But if it's not going to work, if it's just not the right shape for your hand, work something out. And there's of, there often is more than one lock for Chopin. That was awfully slow. I, took a long time for I, I always find it vaguely reassuring that the, the great composers were so inconsistent. <laughs> I mean, I know it produces a lot of work for you, but there's something, there's something very human about it. Um, I, I have two connected questions um, around uh, the way uh, Chopin used markings in his manuscripts. But before I get to those, I just want to, um, to say, please, if you have questions, do, do get them into the Q&A box uh, now, because we won't have much more time. So please do um, let us know if you have some. Um, so these are two connected questions about the way, um, the way Chopin marks up his scores. Uh, one comes from Daniel again, the other from Min Kyu Kim, uh, a deep earth student at the, at the yeah. RCS. So the first relates to long and short accent marks. I'm going to give you both together and see where you go with this. So from Daniel, is there any discernible difference in Chopin manuscripts between short accent marks and longer ones, as has been discussed in Schubert, for example? And before you answer that, I'm going to give you Minkyu's question as well, yeah. which is Chopin often wrote decrescendo hairpins with diminuendo, that's to say dim and then the hairpin, or crescendo with the, the, the crescending hairpin. So some scholars argue that those hairpins mean not getting softer, but getting slower. Do you think hairpins in Chopin's music have something to do with tempo changing? I don't think in Chopin. It, that seems to be the case in Schumann. There's a sorry Schubert in Schubert there's a there's a careful distinction and it nearly always works between diminuendo and decrescendo decrescendo means get quieter but keep moving diminuendo means fade with it for some reason that's it's it's a bit like Brahms using sostenuto meaning to ease back as well it's not explicit but he expects us to understand that it's a descriptive term I don't think that works with with Chopin um, <clears throat> even morendo and smorzando he'll say smorzando e rallentando, where he wants you to slow down as well, or morendo e um, <coughs> rallentando. So I think we have, to, we just have to be guided by musical common sense there. But I, I wouldn't put on the brakes where you don't have to. That's, that's the one thing. And the other thing about the accents and diminuendo marks, a diminuendo hairpin assumes, usually assumes an accent at the beginning. So it means a strong start and then tail away. Um, Malcolm Bilson will tell you that it's almost the same as a, as a slur. A slur has the same meaning for him. That's the, it's the original classical meaning of the slur. And as for accent size, the trouble is they come in all shapes and sizes. And the additions, it's a, it's a printing nightmare. How do, you, how do you reproduce Chopin's accents? If, you try, if the big ones, if you try to reduce, reproduce them, in the distance they cover, it depends. If the manuscript, if the notes are, are cramped up quite close and there are bigger note heads in print, then the same diminuendo sign, if you cover the same number of notes with them, will look, or the, big, the same accent, big accent, will look longer and it changes shape. That's the trouble, they're impossible to reproduce. Almost every edition, including ours, is, uh, is, make, is using two sizes. There's the sort of the small accents, which are just immediate accents. It might be a handful. And the longer ones nearly always imply an agogic leaning. Um, and then the bigger ones, again, we would print as diminuendo hairpins. But there's, they're all related, that's the trouble. And in his, in his manuscripts, they come in all shapes and sizes. The printers didn't always know what to do them with, with them in the original editions. And I don't, 
I don't completely blame them either. <laughs> well, actually, that, that leads quite neatly onto the question I wanted to ask, which uh, was really to do with um, your role as an editor and the, the, the imponderables that you, that you come across in that, in that role. I wondered whether you had um, any, any examples you could give us of real kind of moments of, uh, of head scratching uh, to understand what, uh, what Chopin means in, in, in this, this um, very subtle uh, use of um, musical expressions um, and, and in the light of the inconsistency that arises from time to time. Have you had any real head, head scratching moments? Yes. Um, well, there's one I can show you in the in the etude I didn't have time to play, but the one that is the famous E major, which I'll play it something like the tempo I think you had in mind. <laughs> spread over two staves, it has to be because of the layout of it, and the bass is written on the lower stave, on the lower staff. There are accents which could apply to either voice um, on the lower staff, and it's very hard to tell which ones he meant. You look at his manuscript used for engraving, there's an accent on the C. Now, there's an accent there, is it for rather. One could re read them all as being a gift for the G's, but it becomes a bit monotonous. Or you could read them like the first edition did. The first edition missed, uh, missed half of them out. Let's put the other ones on the B. This time you put too many Bs, or if you put the two, if you read the manuscript a particular way or put them together. is not clear enough to permit any conclusion. He did it in a bit of a hurry. And it's like my favorite sign, which I keep showing from just around the corner from the RCS, fish and chips fresh from the sea. It's, it seemed clear to the person who was writing it at the time. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that sign's gone now, which is a great shame. It has, yes. It, it serves as a wonderful example of ambiguity and text. But I have my photograph of it, which I shall continue to use. It's like show, some of Chopin's accents. I think he thought it was clear where they were meant to go. But if we could ask him now, he probably wouldn't remember, or he would come out with something completely different again. And that's the trouble. Every time he copied a manuscript or every time he proofed it, he changed something. His music's compositionally in a constant state of flux. So there's the answer to fingering and pedaling as well. Um, I, I have one, one final question. I think will have to be a fairly quick answer if you don't mind, Roy, but it comes from Aaron, Aaron Shaw, um, the head of keyboard at the RCS. Roy, how will your new edition set out all of the variables from the sources visually? The, this is the, the strict um, procedure which has been used to set off the new pieces from the other editions. There are so many versions of each piece. We choose one version of a piece, one source, and we stick to it as close as we can. Anything that's obviously wrong, we correct. You can't leave mistakes in it. But we, we make an edition of either the first edition or of the first reprint of the first edition or a final manuscript of the piece if we think the edition has, has been corrupted. And then we show the variants from the other versions round about it on small staves. If there's something, a 40 marking or a crescendo from another one which we think is useful to have in situ, and if it doesn't contradict 
the, con the context of the other source. We can show these in parentheses, but we'll always, always we distinguish them typographically so that you have a system of navigation. You know that this marking came from another source, or if you want to see the English edition does this, or the second French edition does this in the base, or the man such and such a manuscript does this. So <clears throat> you, you've got these variants all visible, but you know which, you know where you are and which version you're in. The thing is many editions, most all editions so far, in fact, including the most recent, the new Polish one, um, <clears throat> will move from one version to another. So it, as you're playing, you have what looks like the editor's <clears throat> definitive choice of readings, which is all it can be. But one minute you're playing one source and then the next minute you're playing another source and it, they don't show you. And it's often it's, it's skillfully enough done, but isn't it nice to know where you are actually? Roy, thank you very much. There are other questions which we've not been able to get to, and there are also some lovely comments um, in, in the chat. And so, um, Roy, we'll make sure that you get all of those questions and all of those comments, just so that you can respond yourself if you get a chance. That would be very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're out of time. There's just enough time for me to uh, let you know that if you missed any of Roy's talk, or if you want to listen to it again, you can find it on the RCS at Home Hub on the Conservatoire's website. And next week at the, the same time of six o'clock on Monday, the exchange talk will be given by Dr. Brianna Robertson Kirkland, whose intriguing title is, and I've got to get this right, A Tale of Two Sopranos, Where Elizabeth Billington and Gertrude Mara Trained by Venazio Rautzini. Well, hopefully we'll get the, uh, the answer to that question <laughs> this time next week. Um, and in the mean, meantime, you can register for that talk and keep up to date with the exchange talks and indeed everything else that's happening in research and knowledge exchange at the Conservatoire by following us on Twitter. Uh, the handle is at RCS underscore the exchange. So until next time, it just remains to say thank you to Roy for an absolutely outstanding talk and also thank you for joining us this evening.